Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, that's for art. I'm going to read a little bit of our book right now. Before I do, I got this from Beyond Nuclear. And this is a list of all the nuclear power plants in the United States. And I want to remind people just exactly what's happened in our government with nuclear industry. All of those circles east of the Mississippi are nuclear reactors. There's 65 of them. You can see the list. They have them numbered, and I thought I'd circle them, and I counted them. So check that out. 51 east of the Mississippi. It is really shocking when you put it like that, when you see it just like that. That's a serious investment and a commitment to nuclear to the nuclear priesthood, which is exactly why they're on the slow train. So I'm going to read our book because we need a little bit of nuclear reality other than the cancers, leukemias, diabetes, obesity, and uh, genetic defects that it's caused. We need to understand the real reality of this all. Uh, we are on Chapter 9. Poison Power, The Case Against Nuclear Power Plants, by two doctors. These guys, it's not just John W. Goffman, it's Dr. John W. Goffman and Dr. Arthur R. Tamplin. They are, uh, uh, they were biochemists and um, biologists, and they understood nuclear physics. So, we're on uh, Chapter 9, which is called Alternatives Available to Us. And uh, we're talking about the further questioning of the wisdom of or the need for increasing the use of uh, nuclear, of electric power consumption. We're talking about he, he uh, not only does he question the wisdom of stimulating electric power consumption, he recognizes the central importance of developing alternative methods for power generation. Okay. Uh, Dr. Abel's remarks follow, quote, uh, new subtitle, cost versus benefits of increased electric power. Typical estimates of future demand for electric power in the United States assume a continuation of the previous rate of growth. Power consumption eight times that of the present is projected for the year 2000. I wonder what the reality of that was. I'm sorry, I'm going to mark this in the book. Because so many times I've been reading and then I can't find it again. So hang on, I'm just going to underline that. Little attention is devoted to the anatomy of the future demand. It is pointed out that population is growing. The gross national product is expanding and energy demands are expected to increase. However, it is physically impossible for exponential growth to continue indefinitely. Already it is apparent that the generation and distribution of electricity entails some damage to the environment. Utilities can be expected to minimize the damage through the use of cleaner fuels, better siting, and underground transmission of power. However, some problems will persist if conventional fuels are employed. The increased demands on them will speed exhaustion of oil and gas. And the large use of quantities of coal is likely to despoil large areas. Nuclear power carries with it many risks. Thus, the utilities can expect to face continuing opposition in their efforts to expand power generation. The outcome of the battle is likely to rest on a balancing of social costs versus the benefits to the consumer. Much of the electric power goes to industry to commercial use. However, the public in, is most immediately affected by that part going to individual consumers. And the, uh, and the electorate is likely to base many of its attitudes on personal experience. If private consumers were to increase their use of power by a factor of eight by the year 2000, where would the demand come from? Only a small fraction of increase would come from population growth. There continues to be a proliferation of electrical gadgetry, but power consumption by most of these devices is trivial. 
For example, an electric razor consumes only a kilowatt hour per year, less than an air-conditioned house uses in an hour. In general, the devices that are commonly intermittent that are used commonly excuse me I want to read that again in general the devices that are used intermittently consume only modest amounts annually major items and their approximate typical annual consumption in kilowatt hours are color television 500 lighting 600 electric range 1200 frost free refrigerator freezer 1700 freezer 1700 water heater 3500 Air conditioning, 5,000. Home heating, 20,000. The more affluent segments of society already have, a, have about all the television sets, lighting, and cooling that can be used. Future expansion of public power consumption is dependent upon an increased standard of living by the less affluent and on widespread adoption of electricity for home heating. At present, only about 3.5 million homes are heated electrically. The major potential market in its is in home heating. Utilities are responding to the public's concern about pollution by extolling the virtues of clean heat. They soft pedal the fact that the pollution problem is merely transferred elsewhere. However, it is technically much more feasible to eliminate pollution in a few major emitters than in, than in millions of homes. Another consideration is the thermodynamic inefficiency introduced when electric in energy is, dis is dissipated resistively. However, if heat pumps were utilized at the homes, the overall efficiency would be acceptable. So-called all-electric living has a major disadvantage that should not be overlooked. It makes society terribly vulnerable to power failure, especially in winter. The era of unquestioned exponential growth in electric power has come to an end. The future course of expansion will, deter will be determined by the public's estimates of cost versus benefits." Unquote. Boy, I think that statement is incorrect. Back to the book. Professor Dean Abramson of the University of Minnesota in Environmental Cost of Electric Power points out that the primary metals industry is by far the largest consumer of electricity. The fastest growing and biggest user is the aluminum industry. It requires five times as much electrical power to produce aluminum as, is, as to produce steel. Substituting steel for aluminum wherever possible could would conserve considerable electrical power. Huh. Substituting steel for aluminum wherever possible. Huh. Moreover, to reclaim steel from junk takes one quarter of the energy to require to produce it from ore. This is kind of twisting my head. That's why I'm reading it. Like, if they know this, why didn't they do this? Like, my head, I just, I can't get over the greed in our country, in our world, in our culture. It's just, I'm overwhelmed by it. Let me get back to the book. Moreover, to reclaim steel from junk takes one quarter of the energy required to produce it from ore. We should begin to recycle steel to the fullest extent, and that whole sentence is in italics as if it's important. One problem here is that copper contained in junked products makes it difficult to recycle steel. Could automobile manufacturers be required to eliminate copper in the manufacture of cars? Aluminum junk is an indestructible litter. Recyclable, recycling aluminum would conserve considerable electric power. In Rodell's Environment Action Bulletin of July 18, 1970, the following appeared. On May 19, Reynolds Aluminum opened an aluminum reclamation center at 5455 Bonnaker Drive in Tampa. 
What has happened since then is an example of what could be done if industry and the public would combine their efforts in an attempt to solve the country's solid waste disposal program. Central Manager James H. Riggs sums it up this way, quote, We didn't expect the terrific response from the public when we opened May 19th. This is a temporary setup. We're planning a new plant a few blocks away from here, and we may double the size of it, unquote. According to Riggs, when the news broke out that Reynolds would pay 10 cents a pound, about a half a cent per can, for aluminum cans brought to the reclamation center, the plant was caught in a deluge of beer and soft drink cans, more than 10,000 tons during the first week of operation. Everybody appears to be getting into the act. For example, a retired man and his son came in with 760 pounds of cans. They picked them up in an eight-hour-long, in eight-hour, in an eight-hour-long, along a quarter-mile stretch of the road in Ocala National Park. Wow. Okay, let me read that again. They picked them up in an eight-hour day, along a quarter-mile stretch of a road on Ocala National Park. The high school boy made $70 in one day bringing in cans. Even children come in with a few cans at a time, says Riggs. Reynolds, who is, has similar centers planned for New York, New Jersey, Houston, San Francisco, and the Pacific Northwest, plans to get 3% of the total aluminum can production back. What makes the program work? It's profitable. Money. I swear to God, this is just getting to me here. Riggs explained, to mine, excuse me, to mine aluminum, you have to lay out millions for your initial capital investment. We bypassed that outlay. To buy a $200, to, to buy a $200 a ton is cheaper than mining at, at $250 or $300 a ton. Unquote. This attractive difference in the cost per ton does not even include the substantial reduction in electrical power consumption. The aluminum company can the aluminum companies can make an equal or greater profit from recycling the aluminum in all kinds of products and at the same time the environment suffers less damage. What's wrong with that? Unfortunately, power consumption is not synonymous with the standard of living. Power consumption relates more directly with the production of litter and solid waste and the decline in the quality of the environment. The biological evidence demonstrates that our technology became coupled, excuse me, the biological evidence demonstrates that our technology became uncoupled from the standard of living in 1950. The increase in the gross national product since that time has been associated mainly with the production of garbage. The biological data demonstrate that infant mortality among 50% of the United States population, those below the median family income, is more than double that which occurs in the upper 25% income bracket. More than that, their life expectancy is reduced in excess of eight years. For 20% of the United States population, those with the lowest family income, the infant mortality rate is four times that of the upper 25% income bracket, and life expectancy is reduced by more than 16 years. This situation has remained static since 1950. During the same period, Environmental pollution has increased to a near crisis proportions. I think we are in the crisis proportions. Our science and technology have not only become uncoupled from society, our environmental pollution and urban decay demonstrate that they are actually detrimental to society. What we need is a master plan for improving the quality of life in this country. It cannot be a piecemeal operation since each sector affects all others. We have the capability today 
to look at these large problems, to isolate the various interlocking factors, to determine the nature of the interplay, and to propose integrated solutions to the problems. We have the scientific and technological knowledge. We have the industrial capacity, capability within an extreme, extremely viable free enterprise system. Let me read that again. We have the industrial capability within an extremely viable free enterprise system. Free enterprise system, that's a fucking lie. And as the space program demonstrated, we have a genius for organization. We could improve the quality of life in this country if we made the effort. In his book, quote, Garbage As You Like It, unquote, Jerome Goldstein holds a number of ways, shows a number of ways that we could do this by creating jobs with garbage while still turning a substantial profit and actually improving the environment. I'm at 15 minutes, guys. I'm going to stop. Uh, we're not even near the end of this chapter. Or maybe we are. I'll finish it up tomorrow night, I guess, because it looks like we've only got four or five pages. But um, once again... I want to show you this. This is stunning. Look at the United States and the commitment that our government has made to nuclear power generation. All of those plants produce over a hundred Hiroshima bombs every year. That's how much, and we have been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years. Let's do the math. Just at St. Louis alone, at the nuclear storage waste, which isn't even on this map, there are 221,000 buried train containers. Seriously, they're buried. That's what's going to be part of the 17-year plan. And we need that to start right away. So anyways, you guys, put your courage feet on, man. We're, we're unpeeling the onion. I actually feel happier. Ackerman and I had this uh, conversation about if you're doing your mission... You feel happy, even though it's a grave situation, which this is, and I get that. But you know what? If we face it and we look at it together, we can figure out the solutions. We just need the truth. Because the people in the nuclear industry right now are freaked out. They are cowards, basically. They need to put their courage feet on. They need to own up. Responsibility looks forward. Blame looks backwards. I get it. We've had a culture of lying and deception, but that can end today. And that's what I'm going to move for. Put your courage feet on, you guys. So, we certainly need it. Remember, happiness is resistance. <laughs> Bye.